Welcome, my name is Harald Sack and this is Knowledge Graphs, lecture number six, Intelligent Applications with Knowledge Graphs and Deep Learning. In this section of the lecture we want to talk about semantic search. So, let's look at this nice picture. How can I find it? What do you think, sir? might really be a problem how to find pictures like that. Nowadays, of course, with visual similarity and image search in Google, you might immediately find where it's from. But how to do this now on a conceptual way without looking at the visual similarity? One way to do that is, of course, it could be related to a larger source where exactly you find a source also for that. And you might find it there to be described as two fearsome sea monsters attacked or attack a disabled ship off the shore of America, of course, in which America is shown in close proximity to Japan. But however, to get this information, of course, it's not found here on the map. So somebody has to provide additional information exactly for what you see there. And this usually is referred to as an annotation. So this is called metadata annotation. What we need here, and we have to annotate our information resources, especially if it's unstructured information that does not necessarily contain textual information. And this has to be then annotated. So how do I do that usually? I can connect exactly that region here in the card with a specific command. So this is the text that we have seen. And you could see also here that I mentioned here the position, which area coordinates exactly in this map are here uh, annotated. However, I also then also need meta information or metadata about the map we are talking about. So this map here has a title, Indie Orientalis Insularum Que Adjacentum Typus, whatever that means. And this is from Theatrum Orbis Terrarum. That's the Latin edition of the famous, you know, Atlas of Abraham Ortelius. So famous um, Dutch geographer here of the Renaissance in 1603. This is external information that somehow, of course, has to be connected then to our source to find it and also then the source has to be annotated. So annotation, we should remember, is a prerequisite. So documentation annotation with explicit semantics enables in the end semantic search. So what we mean by that is we want to annotate also semantic entities and not only write additional texts. An example where you can see exactly what semantic annotation means, you can see here in a block that is also maintained by us. So if you follow the link, you come to the Sky High block, which is a daily block here on science, techniques and arts in history. And we have here an article about Abraham uh, Ortelius and his Theatrum Orbis Terrarum. And what you can see here, you see here that in that block, that's a usual ordinary WordPress block, all of the um, entities that you might find here, they are underlined. And if you hover then over the entities, it takes a while. And then you get some information about these entities. Probably here that Antwerp here is a city and it's the death place of Abraham Ortelius, but also the birthplace of Anthony van Dijk, for example. And more information that comes directly from DBpedia and that has been annotated here. You, so you see here for all of the entities additional information with which exactly this text also has been annotated. And this simply works by annotating here the entities that you see here explicitly with the URIs where exactly this information comes from. And this can be also done by automated annotation. <coughs> Another nice feature that I want to show you is of course based on these annotations, we can provide then visualizations and show you how exactly the terms and things in this article are related with each other. So with this nice um, visualization, you might see, for example, that the death place of Gerardus Mercator, that's a colleague of uh, Abraham Ortelius, um, is somehow in Germany. And um, it was exactly in Duisburg, which is in Germany. And they are related with each other. Or, for example, um, the birthplace of that guy is Ruppelmont, whatever that is. And he was uh, educated at the old University of Leuven. And that's, of course, in the city of Leuven. And if you want to know what 1512 was, that was the birth year of that guy. Or 1830, that's interesting. That's the founding year of Belgium, which is, of course, 
in which also is the birthplace of uh, Geratus Mercator. So this enables really the exploration of this information that is stored somehow, first of all in the article that you are reading there, plus in the knowledge base that is behind there. So just try it out. And this entity-wise annotation enables also entity-based information retrieval. And this is then in the end also language independent, which is nice because we are referring to entities, to things, and not to strings anymore. There are several ways to annotate, of course, single entities in texts or also in unstructured data. And one standard that is often used is the so-called web annotation ontology. That's a W3C standard. Now from 2017, there's a version and that specifies an interoperable, interoperable framework for creating associations between related resources, annotations, and so on. That's quite easy because you have here, for example, an annotation that you create and this annotation has a body, which means this is the text that you provide there or the information with which you annotate and you have a target, which is the object that is annotated. So it follows a really simple architecture. And if, for example, you want to annotate here the text here that states something about Abraham or Telius, you create for that text string here an annotation of type open annotation uh, ontology annotation. And this has a body here, of course, and this is um, the thing with which I want to annotate. That's the DBpedia resource of Abraham Ortelius. And the target here is a specific resource that we are targeting here. That's our source text. So this thing that you see here. And of course, this is from position 1 to position 16. You can exactly say what position in the text here is annotated with a specific URI or entity. And that then can can be perfectly used for semantic search. So that's nice. Going back to traditional information retrieval, we have already spoken about that in traditional information retrieval is dependent on natural language. And there we have all the ambiguity of natural language to deal with. We have different words and expression for the same concept. So we are dealing with synonyms, metaphors, and paraphrases. We have implicit and hidden information and context information and experience. It's rather important to find the appropriate answers that the user has in mind when looking, when searching for something. Now let us ask, how can Knowledge Graph support information retrieval? By looking at the traditional information retrieval process, we have, of course, always a document store in the middle. And to fill the document store, first we have text acquisition, text transformation. An index has to be created from the text documents, and this is the index then. And that also determines then the results and the ranking of the stuff that the user was searching. So we have a component for user interaction, and of course we have an evaluation component, and in the end we have a ranking of the results that will be provided by the index. And and the ranking function, of course, that should be individually for each user determines how well the user likes the results or not. So that's the typical retrieval and indexing process in information retrieval. Now, knowledge graphs can easily be integrated into that process, so they can be put in the middle between the document store and the index. And then, of course, they are influencing very much the ranking, the interaction, the text transformation, and the index creation in general. So let us have a closer look of what then becomes semantic search. What is semantic search? Semantic search is about going beyond documents and queries as back of words. So we do not treat documents as a back of words. The sequence of words still matters, and especially the meaning of the words matters. Semantic research has a deeper understanding of document contents by leveraging world knowledge as structured data. So we are using external sources like encyclopedias on the web, like we're using Wikipedia, we are using Wikidata, we will use DBpedia, and we will go with our answers beyond the 10 blue links that you know from Google. So just have a look at the um, results we are showing you when we do document exploration in the blog example that we just had. And we provide users with direct answers sometimes, also in their natural language. And a prerequisite to semantic search always is, of course, the annotation of the text or of the documents with explicit semantics. It means semantic entities have to be uh, put in it.
And then we end up with something which is called entity-based information retrieval. And since we are then looking for entities, it might become language independent, which of course is rather important nowadays also for search engines. And it makes use of underlying knowledge bases or knowledge graphs, which means content-based similarities among entities will be taken into consideration, as well as content-based relationships between entities. And of course, we have interoperable metadata via these semantic operations for content-based description and for structural and technical description. And it enables also content-based navigation, as we have seen, and result filtering. So you could do semantic search facets and then also then faceting your search result accordingly. Okay, what are the benefits of semantic search on the first and of course, I can use it for query string refinement, not only query string uh, completion, query string refinement. So you could suggest, for example, more precise or more complete queries in that sense. Cross-referencing, it enables to complement your search results with additional associated or similar information. We can also, let's say, make our search a bit more fuzzy, not, let's say, direct and correct, but make it more fuzzy. Also take into consideration stuff that lies nearby your original search result. That is not exactly what you are looking for, but things which are rather similar, which are close by, either by similarity or by relation. So that is kind of fuzzy search that you could enable. And if you then direct this fuzzy search according to the needs of the user, you might end up in some exploration scenario and the, then you have exploratory search and this enables also visualization and navigation of your entire search space. Of course you need the right tools to uh, make this going in the end and of course this might revolutionize all kind of search and of course the dealing that we have our days with the web and the immense content that we see on the web. Overall, in the end, it also enables reasoning, which means we could complement search result with implicitly given information, information that is not necessarily found in the documents we were looking for, but of course that could be entailed via a reasoning procedure over these semantic annotations that we have about the documents. So let us look at some concrete examples how simple entity-based search might be implemented. We start here with a simple entity matching. So that's the most simplest form. What we have here, we have a query, Ortelius first atlas. So we want to see something, some documents about the first atlas that uh, Ortelius has produced. And um, let's here first see what we are going to index. So here is a document, for example, that says Ortelius publishes the first world atlas. And we do simple entity matching. So first thing what we have to do, of course, we have to analyze the query string, which means we have to see which entities are there in the query string. And we do call something which is called named entity linking. We know this already from natural language processing. And we will find out Ortelius, yeah, this might be, if the goal or the target of entity linking here is DBpedia, might be the DBpedia URI of Abraham Ortelius and Atlas. There is also, of course, a DBpedia URI for that. Of course, then also for indexing, either there are already semantic annotations or the indexer has to do also named entity linking on the text. And probably the indexer then also maps here Ortelius to Abraham Ortelius and Atlas to the other Atlas. So this is named entity linking. And here that's the very simplest case that could also be achieved via matching pure text in the end. However, we have to do then an entity matching between the entities that have been found in the index and the entities that have been found in the query. And by doing that, then of course, this document would be ranked and would be among the results that are achieved based on exactly that query string. That is simple entity matching. Going one step further, the same query, we now want to also include similarity-based entity matching results. So thereby, when are two entities similar? Two entities are considered to be semantically similar if they share, for example, property value pairs or if they share properties with similar values. And therefore, they are also considered here in the search result. Again, first of all, 
query processing named entity linking on the query string as well as named entity linking here on the index document and we may find out that here of course we have a direct hit which is atlas so this is exactly the same so this would be a match for the entity matching but we have there also Gerardus Mercator and we might find out that Gerardus Mercator is similar to the entity we are looking for to Abraham Ortelius and the other part Atlas that is really matching and by this matching criteria again then we could complement exactly this document in the answer by simply saying yeah this is not the correct answer this is an answer that has been achieved by similarity based entity matching and according to the similarity of the entities and the count of the entities we could create a ranking among these entities within the search results we are looking for so that would then also enable us to make our search a bit more fuzzy besides similarity the next thing what would also be interesting would be relationship based entity matching again first step to do same query so we do entity linking on the query string and we have Abraham Ortelius and Atlas from DBpedia. Again then if we look at a more extensive named entity linking of the document to be indexed we have here again Mercator's Atlas of Europe and there we have for example Atlas, Gerardus Mercator, we have Mapmaker there and we have Cartographer there. Mapmaker and Cartographer are ma mapped to the DBpedia entity Cartographer and Gerardus Mercator, there is an entity of course, and as well as Atlas. Now we might find out by further analysis of these found entities that of course there are relations among these entities. First of all Gerardus Mercator, which we have found to be similar to our search entity Abraham Ortelius, has the occupation cartographer as well as Abraham Ortelius had the occupation uh, um, cartographer. Simply by that relation that we have here between the entity we were searching for and also then here the document we are indexing, we could again then find matches here that are relationship based. And of course this is also at a specific distance depending on how close is this relation and you know how well identifies this or how important is this uh, information regarding the subject that I'm considering. We could also create again then a ranking among many relationship based entity matchings and by that present an answer accordingly. So this would be three methods how to apply semantic similarity within your semantic search. And this would uh, give us the possibility to improve these traditionally achieved search results with the help of semantic technologies. If you want to go one step further and then beyond mere semantic entity-based search, we then are going to explore exploratory search. And this is closely related to recommender systems, which will be subject of the final lecture of this season.